got a few of those and then we'll also we've got to think about your series uh with uh, today, one of the UK's foremost academics on environment and, environmental and energy policy, Sadita Helm. Um, we convened this series, uh, which is part of Onward's wider Getting to Zero programme, because we felt that there was a growing gap between the increasingly strident political commitments uh, made by world leaders uh, towards decarbonisation and net zero, um, many of which were on show at President Biden's uh, recent summit. Um, and a gap between that and the political and practical realities of achieving those commitments and delivering on some of the substantial shifts that will be required to both deliver net zero and deliver uh, energy security and um, low energy costs for consumers. Um, as we put it in our latest report, Greening the Giants, uh, delivering net zero by 2050 represents a bigger transformation of the economy and society than the Industrial Revolution, but on a much stricter timeline and all by government decree. So if we are, be, are, if, if we are to be successful, and clearly uh, we must, uh, we are going to need to confront some quite difficult realities. For example, uh, the reality that we need to start now, um, that there is very little time to waste and lots of the processes that will be necessary to achieve that goal take years, if not decades. Um, B, that net zero will disrupt some people's lives and certain places considerably more than others. Uh, and that will require some specific policies to support those people and those places to make that transition. Um, C, that government will have to perhaps take a more active role in aligning incentives and supporting innovation than it might normally be comfortable with, and that markets alone may not get us there fast enough. Um, and fourthly, that net zero will require global coordination, global structures and incentives um, to ensure that progress in one country does not simply mean offshoring emissions in another. Um, now, we know the government is starting to grapple with many of those realities. Uh, last week, signed up to the Climate Change uh, Committee's ambitious goal of reducing UK emissions by 78% by 2035, including for the first time aviation and shipping emissions. We know that in the coming months, we'll see the results of a swathe of reviews from the Treasury Net Zero Review to the Department for Transport Decarbonisation Strategy to the Heat and Buildings Decarbonisation Strategy. And of course, we're hosting COP26 in Glasgow later this year too. So there is an enormous amount of activity, um, but a huge number of questions too. What should all those reviews say? Where should the government be focusing its energies? How can we reconcile net zero with wider questions around the cost of energy um, and such like? And how can policymakers crucially take consumers, companies and voters with them as they take those difficult decisions? Um, and I'm delighted to be welcome, welcoming today uh, one of the few people who has serious answers to all of these questions and uh, certainly uh, one of um, the leading authorities on uh, environmental energy policy in this country. Um, Sadita Helm is a British economist. Uh, he's an academic. He's currently the Professor of Energy Policy at the University of Oxford. Um, he's provided advice to the UK and uh, European governments across many of these issues, including the cost of energy review for Theresa May's government when I was in Downing Street and for the European Commission as they prepared their energy roadmap 2030. He is also the author of several books, including the excellent Net Zero, um, which addresses the action we all need to take to tackle the climate emergency, personal, local, national and global. Um, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Dieter for his remarks. He'll speak for about 20, 25 minutes. Um, but before I do, I want to just set out a few housekeeping tips. Firstly, we will be taking questions after Dieter's remarks, so please do post questions in the Q&A uh, section by pressing the button at the bottom of your screen. Second, if you have any technical problems, um, please post a message in the chat or email my team at office at ukonward.com and someone will do their best to help you as quickly as possible. And thirdly, just a reminder that this session ends at 3 p.m. So if you do have questions, if you do have comments, please post them early to avoid disappointment. And I apologize in advance if I'm not able to come to your question before the end of the session. Um, but that's it from me. Uh, I have great pleasure in now handing over to our speaker today, uh, Sadita Helm. Dieter. Well, thank you, Will, for that very kind introduction. Um, you've set a pretty big exam uh, paper for me, and I'll try to deal with 
uh, some of the dimensions, but obviously not all. And I want to do it in three bits. Uh, I want to talk first of all about what near net zero really means, because there's a huge amount of misunderstanding about what uh, the target means and what it would do if it was achieved. I want to make some remarks about the energy white paper uh, and the blizzard of documentation produced by the government uh, before Christmas, I think 2000 papers worth of um, uh, reports, etc. The proposals, 10 point plans and so on. And then I want to relate that back to the cost of energy review, which I did for Greg Clark, um, which was supposed to be in ahead of a white paper that Greg Clark was going to produce. Not because I want to kind of vindicate everything I said in the cost of energy review, but because I want to remind people of what the substantive questions that need to be addressed in policy terms are, and which won't go away just by pretending, um, well, we're not quite keen on particular bits of the proposals. So that's my canvas. And the most important bit is to start with what net zero is, what it means, and what would be achieved if we actually met it. Now, the first thing to say is that net zero as defined is a unilateral carbon production territorial target. And all of those words matter. We have effectively said, although there are some uh, get outs in the Climate Change Act, moderate get outs, that we are going to achieve net zero carbon territorial uh, production by 250. And we've now said we're going to be 78% of the way there in 15 years time. Now, I suspect that many of the people listening uh, to this uh, and watching and most of the British public think to the extent they thought about this at all, that that means that when we get to net zero, as the uh, Climate Change Committee said, we will no longer be calling, uh, causing uh, climate change. That just isn't true. In fact, the uh, report by the Climate Change Committee in 2019 recommending the net zero uh, target be adopted and hence the Climate Change uh, Act amended, actually said, when we get to zero, we will no longer be uh, causing climate change. Wrong, wrong, wrong again. We do not want to get to zero. You and I are made of carbon. It's not a zero carbon world we're trying to construct, create. The objective of all this is to limit the increase of the carbon concentration in the atmosphere, a stock, because that is, uh, greenhouse gases more generally, that stock of carbon in the atmosphere is what is the greenhouse and the greenhouse effect. Now, just because you stop producing steel in Britain, and you import the stuff from China, it may be the case that your uh, progress to net zero is accelerated, but you will be increasing climate change as a result. Okay? And that's why in my book, especially, I try to emphasize the only unilateral basis by which we can make sure we discharge our true ethical responsibility and make sure that we don't cause any more climate change and therefore do not contribute to further increases in the carbon concentration in the atmosphere is carbon consumption, not carbon production. We have to look at what we consume, what our carbon footprint is, irrespective of whether the things we buy include petrochemicals made in America or Europe or here, steel made in China or here or elsewhere. And this has a very, very serious import to the, the struggle to deal with climate change. The fact is that every single year since 1990, two parts per million have been added to the atmosphere, without exception. Without exception for the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, and unbelievably, without exception in 2020. Just think about that. You lock down all the major developed economies in the world, you cut emissions substantially in the short term, and the concentration of the carbon in the atmosphere keeps going up. That's a really salutary thing to know. And what in totality it tells you is the last 30 years have been wasted. You can argue it could have been even worse, 
But if you were in 1990 and you set forth on the UN program, particularly 1992, and you were told you will be adding two parts per million every year for the next 30 years and you won't make a dent in that process, you would have been appalled. And so this idea that at COP26 and elsewhere, one more heave down the current path is going to get us there is, in my view, utterly naive. That doesn't mean that COP26 isn't a good idea. It doesn't mean that people are assigning targets. It, that isn't a good idea. But you have to remember that carbon is global, not national, not English carbon. It's global carbon. And to that, you have to add one other really salutary consideration. Climate change will not get solved in Europe or the US. There'll be important parts to it, but what really matters is China, India, Africa, Brazil. And for all the enthusiasm, China did not sign up to any new targets at Mr. Biden's summit. On the contrary, it reiterated that its intention is to peak in 230 and that it uh, wants to be carbon neutral in 260. It is more than half the total coal burn, China. It is opening more power stations, coal power stations now than all those closures in America and Europe put together. And looking at the global level, for all the excitement going on, we need some cool realism. We're going back towards 100 million barrels a day oil burn, and the coal burn remains pretty close to its peak. And there is no way that this planet can survive the continued fossil fuel burn on the trajectory intended, even if China peaks in 230 and keep within the two degrees. And, and that just seems to me to be part of the fundamentals of the problem. Now, if we turn to India, India said, or rather its energy minister said, quoted on the BBC, that the aspirations at COP26 were pie in the sky, that's the quote, and that if the West wanted, uh, which has by far the greatest responsibility for the carbon already in the atmosphere, India to change its development path and not benefit from, I think he said, skyscrapers, for example, then they should pay the Indians not to do it. Well, that's the old North-South debate back to Brundtland, and it's absolutely right. Why should the Brazilians or the Indians sacrifice economic development when we in the West did not live on the basis of that, have much higher carbon um, consumption per head, and um, now want them to do it, even though the stock up there in the carbon atmosphere is out. So this is a north-south divide. And the idea that 100 billion will crack this problem, you know, that's a third of what we spent on the coronavirus in the UK, right? This is substantial flows. And when we come to Africa, Africa's population may actually double by mid-century. China, by the way, on current growth rates in 15 years' time will be twice its current size economically and we add Brazil and other countries in. Now I make these remarks because the climate change problem is a global problem and it will not be solved in Oxford or in Birmingham or in England or in Europe, although we have important contributions to make. And if we really mean what we say, that we don't want to actually cause any more, let alone meet up to our historical responsibility, then, and I'm sorry if it makes me sound angry, but it's important, we have to address our carbon consumption. And it makes no sense for the British economy to have a discussion as they did in 2019 in the debate about um, net zero and we've been having recently about whether we should close the steel industry down. Well, you know, it doesn't, if you want to achieve net zero and you want to make fast progress, it's, there's some pretty straightforward things to do. Close the steel industry, close Ineos's Grangemouth plant, close the other six refineries, hope that Brexit kills off the car industry, and then take out a few more bits of British industry. We're 80% services. And the gap between carbon consumption and carbon production in this country is really big. So I think this is a deadly serious problem. And I think the British public have been misled to believe that we in England 
or in, in Great Britain, United Kingdom, are going to solve climate change if we get our emissions down. That's a necessary, but by no means sufficient condition. Now, the second illusion, which is added to the first one, which is that net zero is actually going to stop us causing climate change, is the idea this is all going to be cheap. Indeed, the Climate Change Committee tells us it might cost 1% of GDP, but the number could actually be positive. Right? So when someone tells me they've seen a miracle, to quote um, roughly David Hume, I've got two options. I can A, believe them, or B, I can think of some other rational explanation. Okay. And my other rational explanation is that there are a lot of people who would like us to believe that it is going to be cheap because they want us to adopt certain policies. And, you know, when the Climate Change Committee, an excellent committee, when they produce their uh, sixth carbon budget, the big piece of spin, all the media stuff was, it's only going to cost 1% of GDP. So being a, a, a difficult academic, I looked into this to see whether 1% was in fact true, because it really would be wonderful, because we can just stop the subsidies now. We don't have to worry about customer bills going up. And indeed, if it's going to be net positive, um, we, you know, we really can even think about going to tax in these areas. Okay, So it turns out that the 1% is derived from the idea that everything the government does in terms of interventions is perfect. There will be no government failures. Now, you know, I, I'm in favor of government doing lots of things, but I'm not naive. I look at the smart meter program as just one example. I look at what happened with PPE. I look at a whole host of interventions in the energy sector, and I've written a history of the energy sector. It's littered with government failures, right? And the idea that somehow magically we've learned all the lessons from the past and they're going to come right this time, that's just naive, right? Doesn't mean you shouldn't do this stuff. But I want to square with the British public. I want to tell them, A, you're going to have to change your ways. It's your consumption. It's you and me that pollute. We buy the oil and gas. We buy the, the petrochemicals. We buy the carbon intensive food that's consumed. It's not industry's fault. It's us ultimately, our consumers. We have to confront that. And by the way, I want to tell people it isn't going to be free. And the reason I want to do that is A, because I think it won't be free, but B, because when they find out it isn't free, there's going to be the real risk that people give up on what we really need to be doing in climate change terms. So I, without any apology, would like a policy of honesty about costs. And you see, if you believe it's all free, as I said in my book rather flippantly, and I, you know, Sometimes you just have to be flippant to make the, make the observation. I really want to see those activists outside Parliament with placards saying, end renewable subsidies now. Because, of course, we don't need these subsidies if it's true that renewables are cost competitive with fossil fuels, etc. Now, I wish they were. In the end, they probably will be, but they're not yet. That's why I'm very supportive of subsidies for these technologies. We need active intervention here, but you can't have it both ways. You can't say they're all cost competitive now, there's no problem, they're the te technology of choice. And on the other hand, say you just want those subsidies there and you want those protected markets and you want those CFDs, especially for those technologies. Not both ways. It's going to cost, it requires investment. And, and that feeds through into the, the, the policy front now, the, the, the 10 point plan, the interim report, the net zero review, the Climate Change Committee's sixth carbon budget, the national infrastructure strategy, the energy white paper. I mean, you know, if you could do this by, by policy publications, would have solved the problem already. Okay, so a 10 point plan. Okay, so it's a lovely piece of politics. Blair would have been proud of it. Okay, it says everyone's a winner. We're going to do them all. So it's not a choice between investing a lot of money in nuclear or a lot of money in offshore wind, we do both. It's not hydrogen or some alternative, we do both. It's not energy efficiency or generation, we do those. We'll do all 10, okay? And there are two features that follow from that. Since you avoid the choices and don't specify if you do X, you can't do Y, it's bound to be more expensive in the end. And, you know, I mean, goes back to the Blair government where we were going to have 
cheap energy, which was also secure and low carbon. Put the word and in instead of the word or, and it makes much better politics. But climate change, if I'm right, is going to cost and it's crucial and requires some hard things to be done, requires an or. We can't do it all. And if you look at the 10 point plan, the green homes um, uh, uh, scheme, et cetera, that was the one that's going to create the most jobs. I think it was about the same numbers of jobs as I remember Chris Hume was going to uh, create with the original Green Deal. It lasted eight weeks. Right? That just tells you how credible and, uh, and substantive we have not got to. And if you look at the amount of money that's actually in the 10 point plan, that's actually government new money, it's incredibly small relative to the task. Now, I'm not against that because it's the private sector that's gonna to have to do a lot of this stuff, but you can't have it always. You can't have cakeism here, right? You can't pretend that it's all good jobs. It's all going to be in the north. It's not going to cost anything on customer bills. And, you know, we're unilaterally going to help solve climate change because we're going to stop contributing with the framework of policy we've got at the moment. That won't do, and it will be found out. And some of the naivety of these estimates, you know, I don't know what the actual cost is going to be, but I think in one of the documents, it tells you, I think it's the energy white paper, but I may be wrong about this, that it estimates that, in 2050, 10,000 jobs in smart technologies will be created. Well, who the hell knows what's going to happen in 2030? Right? These kind of estimates are just way out of any credible frame. The reason people like me like markets and competition is because we don't know the future. Governments don't always know best. Markets find new ideas out. They test things out. People go bust. Um, and innovation and technology is happening fantastically fast in this space. So if you ask me what the costs are going to be in 235, you know, my honest answer is I have only the vaguest clue. And I want to design a system which incentivizes us to do what needs to be done to achieve the targets at the lowest possible cost. That's why I like carbon pricing. Right. If I knew that the right answer was a cost curve which told you that you know nuclear power cost this offshore wind cost that uh, next generation solar cost this hydrogen cost that which is the stuff that's now trotted out on a regular basis you know forget the market let's just have state planning since you know the answer and you assume that it's going to be costless you're not going to make any mistakes why have the inefficiency of markets and capitalism and all that stuff when you can just do it because you know the answers. And the, what we've learned is that the state is good at some things and not at others. And that goes to the heart of the muddle in the white paper and what I tried to do in the cost of energy review. It's not the market or the state. You know, hopefully we've grown up from that debate. Okay. The state creates the framework within which markets function. You know, capitalism only got going when the Tudor state was formed to impose property rights and create a frame within which markets could then thrive. Laissez-faire is a state of dangerous anarchy. Even the mafia don't let that happen. Okay? So you have to sort out what the state should do, and you have to sort out then what the maximum domain of the market is within the ignorance we have about how the future is going to unfold. So, you know, the, the, the white paper, it's 150 pages, which is quite short by modern forms. It's got 35 half page pictures in it. It's got 11 full page pictures. It's got one announcement about choosing, in my mind, the wrong option, which is the UK ETS, and 27 reviews I accounted that it announces. That isn't what I think a white paper is. It's a whole process of continuous consultation in a context where Actually, what we need is, yes, some consultation. Some things aren't clear yet, but we need some decisions. Okay? So what I tried to do in the cost of energy review, and I do stand by the, the substance of that review through all the lobbyists and fog that's been created uh, since then, is the following. To say, okay, 
what is it that government has to do? What is it government has to decide in the energy sector? So I wasn't dealing with agriculture, transport and heating, which actually much more important than, than, than the power sector now, but just in that frame. So first of all, the government has to ensure the security supply. Security supply is a system property. It's not the summation of the decisions of all the individual players. And worse, it's certainly not what would happen if you told energy suppliers that they had to meet a reliability criteria. The system as a whole, what each player does affects every other player. And the system as a whole has to make sure the lights stay on. And much more so now than 10 years ago, because the digital economy, uh, the cyber economy is one where the asymmetric costs of interruption are really serious. And anyone who reflects on the idea that we had a major power cut in uh, August 2019, because one wind farm or one power station went down and looks at the disruption caused by that, realizes how deeply serious this issue is. And because we have lots of intermittent technologies, inevitably because that's the way the low carbon stuff goes, we need a hell of a lot more capacity than we previously had. And it's the job of government to make sure that that capacity is there. So I unambiguously uh, uh, want the government to say, this is the security supply margin for the system. Change it over time, but give formal guidance from the Secretary of State, so the Secretary of State is responsible for that guidance. Now, my view is he or she should not make sure it happens. I want a separate system uh, regulator, system planner, system operator, call you what you will, whose job is to ensure that that's achieved. And that is why I'm in favor of splitting out part of the system operator from national grid and creating that function as a public function, not a private function. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is we have to achieve the carbon targets and nobody in their right minds thinks the carbon targets should be delegated to market participants. That's a job for the state. And those are the two things that we have to achieve. Now, the other feature of this new world we're going into, which is critical to market design and critical to energy policy, is that much, if not most, of the low carbon technology is zero marginal cost. And the whole structure of energy markets for the last 100, 150 years is based on marginal costs, and in particular, fossil fuel marginal costs. The cost of a wind farm is the cost of the capital construction of it and some operating costs. The idea that the price of the output of the wind farm should be what happens to be the wholesale cost of producing gas is okay when there's a limited amount of renewables on the system, but not when it's overwhelmingly zero marginal cost. And what's happened with the new technologies, nuclear already had it, is that these are much more like utilities than they are like old fashioned power generation. They're basically large fixed and sunk capital costs. And that's why the capacity contracts and the CFDs and so on are increasingly like uh, RAB based payments that happen within the utilities. So I think the energy world is moving from wholesale variable cost basis to utility fixed cost basis. And that's why I think the capacity market is central. And you can only achieve security supply if you auction firm power, not um, non firm power. And the reason I want this auction is because I want the maximum competition to produce that capacity. And because it's firm power, which is what security supply is defined in terms of, I want the maximum incentive for those players with less than firm capacity, you know, wind farm adds something to security supply, but not 100%, to have the maximum incentive to develop the balancing reliability backup markets to get their uh, capacity more towards firm. On the demand side, demand side measures, storage, batteries, I mean, there's a host of technologies coming. The markets um, will test out all sorts of things. People go bust. Government's got no idea what it should be backing here, except the R&D that lies behind it. So my world of uh, security supply requirement, a system operator, an equivalent firm power capacity market, and then incentivizing the market to find the backups for that is part of it. The other component is the climate change side. 
And on the climate change side, I made a number of remarks, which I stand by in the cost of energy review. The first thing is that the legacy costs should stop determining consumer prices and be parked and socialized. You don't want consumers paying high prices for renewable energy in their bills because the prices were very high in 2012 or whenever. The price of renewables has been coming down and that should be reflected, as by the way, as the price of gas, that should be reflected in consumers seeing benefits, not ever higher costs from the juggernaut of uh, past legacy costs, some of which were arguably mistakes and some of them not. That's an aside, but it's the very important part of the bills that we need to address. But the really important thing about carbon is to decide whether you want the state to decide which technologies should produce the low carbon outcome, or you want the market to do that. If you care about climate change, you don't give a damn what produces the low carbon output. You just want low carbon output and you don't want high carbon output. And I don't know any economists or hardly any economists who would not say that in theory, the most efficient way of achieving that outcome is to have a carbon price. And I would go further and I let the carbon price go to whatever level is necessary to achieve the target, like the interest rate is supposed to. I say supposed to in the case of the Bank of England, but there are lessons about institutional independence as to why it doesn't. Okay, So that's in principle what you should do. You should have a carbon price and in particular carbon tax. And you should apply it at the border to make sure that imports are treated on the same basis as stuff domestically. Now, I readily accept that the politics of carbon taxes are very difficult. Okay, But because they're very difficult, does not abolish the underlying problem you think that arises. I would project that any other mechanism other than a carbon tax will end up being more expensive than the carbon tax would have been. You don't abolish the cost because you don't want to confront people explicitly with them in a carbon tax. The worst possible option is a UK ETS. And the Treasury produced a excellent analysis of the options last autumn, a carbon tax shadowing the EU EU ETS or UK ETS, and I think um, uh, good arguments were made for the carbon tax, particularly because you could then extend it to heating, um, to agriculture, and um, to transport. Um, politically, a no-go. So what do we have instead? The possibility of a sector-by-sector -sector, uh, emissions trading UK-based system wide open to lobbying and which will be incredibly hard to extend to transport, heating and agriculture, which we need to do. Remind you just by the way that in order, batting order, heating is the biggest contributor to domestic territorial, so carbon production territorial uh, emissions. Transport is next. Power is after that and not far behind is agriculture. And just on the side, agriculture is 0.6% of GDP, 0.6% of GDP, recorded emissions of 10%, 11%, without including soils and peats properly. And soils, by the way, have four times the carbon of the atmosphere. You know, a carbon tax sorts out where the cheapest options are. A UK emissions trading scheme sorts out the sectors on the basis of lobbying and starts with a narrow basis and has a huge problem of, um, of going further. So I readily accept that this government is not going to introduce a carbon tax anytime soon, but I don't accept any argument suggests there's a consequence it's going to be cheaper for customers. It's going to be more expensive. Just disguising the com, uh, carbon tax in higher prices for particular technologies the government chooses to pick does not make them go away. And in the end, the, the problem will have to be confronted. How much will taxpayers contribute? How much will consumers contribute? So those are just remarks to set the scene of, of what I've said. I think the most important is to understand what the climate change problem is and what net zero is and is not. I think it's crucial to be deeply sceptical about the 1% costs. And I think it's crucial to realise that the governments need to support the uh, transition, including with money and taxpayers' money, is a lot greater than is currently envisaged. And then I think the cost of energy uh, review structure with the capacity market and the carbon component, 
and the auctioning maximizes competition while making sure the state does what the state should do. And I'll stop at that point and delighted to answer any questions. And particularly if people can point out things I've got wrong, which is much more interesting. Dita, thank you so much for that. Um, that was um, uh, enormously uh, um, kind of valuable, but also um, brilliantly provocative as well. You have, um, I'm sure, made, you've certainly made me think, I'm sure you've made everyone on the call think, um, and challenged some of our basic assumptions about um, net zero and certainly some of the as you put it, delusions that pervade some of the public debate. Um, I was I was struck by one remark you said early on in your um, uh, in your in your speech where you <coughs> where you said um, we need some cool realism, um, and I think that <coughs> sorry, excuse me, that's exactly what you offered um, uh, everyone today. So thank you very very much. Um, I will now go to um, to Q and A. So just urging everyone on the call to uh, to pose your questions in the Q and A box um, if you have them to ensure that they get asked. Um, I'm going to abuse the um, uh, position of the chair just to ask just ask one question at the beginning, which um, uh, kind of responds to something you you kind of spoke about a little bit at the end there, Dita, which was um, the uh, the kind of the case for a carbon tax and um, uh, and uh, the kind of delusion of government that it can that it can pick some of these technologies. Of course, one of the one of the other kind of criticisms or challenges to a carbon tax, um, and one of the reasons why it's politically so difficult is that it's um, it will have a disproportionate impact. Like all taxes, uh, it's likely to be regressive in some way, especially if it's um, uh, targeting carbon consumption um, uh, uh, and may well lead to people who are worse off or, or, or certain places typically, um, obviously the more carbon intensive parts of the country are uh, less productive, poorer, um, have uh, weaker labour markets, etc. cetera. Um, to what extent do you think government can realistically mitigate some of that challenge about the regressive nature of carbon tax or potentially regressive nature of carbon taxes? Um, are there ways in which you would suggest ministers should go about introducing a carbon tax to ensure that the impact was proportionate on different groups and that certain parts of the country weren't disproportionately disadvantaged? Okay, so th there are a couple of points about this. Uh, first, just, just add one more, more thing to the, the thing you said at the top. I, I don't think it's a, I don't think any of this is purist. Okay, so, you know, there are certain stakes in the ground that government will have to make decisions about which go beyond simply carbon taxes. For example, a nuclear decision is not a market decision, it's a state decision. Okay, that's a stake in the ground. And, and Greg Clark used to talk about this, uh, but there are some other things. I mean, you know, the scale of the offshore wind uh, industry, the 40 gigawatts, that's a stake in the ground. So some parameters get fixed by the state because the state will inevitably have some role in picking technologies, whether you like it or not. So the carbon tax and, uh, and carbon pricing is fitted with that frame. Now, the strategies that you have available are, A, do you do the thing that will produce the most efficient answer? So the cheapest way of achieving your objectives of secure supply and um, decarbonisation, and then try and sort out some of the consequences that flow, including distribution. Or you say distribution things are so difficult, so we won't try that. We'll try something more expensive instead. Now we're in the latter box, not the former at the moment. Okay, so that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is it is true that it's consumption that lies at the heart of the climate change problem. And therefore, it's true that we're living beyond our sustainable means. Whether we like it or not, we're living beyond our sustainable environmental means, in particular in respect of the climate. We're not paying for the externalities, the things we're causing, mainly to other people around the world. If we did do it, do those things would be more expensive, and then we would be somewhat worse off than we are. That's another reason why it's so hard to crack climate change because people want, even when they have coronavirus and lockdowns for a year, they want to resume the standard of living they had at the beginning and pretend nothing happened. Or we just dump that on the young and make them pay the debt in the future. So the fundamental is that if you ultimately look at the great environmental challenges of our day, biodiversity and climate change, the populations of the world are living at a consumption level, which is too great. And that is politically dynamite. Because the moment you tell people, look, actually, it's a little bit more like um, it would be if you were fighting the Second World War, you're going to have to take a hit. 
they don't want to do it. Now, the second thing to say is this thing about regression, the regressiveness. So you have this kind of illusion that the taxes we have at the moment aren't regressive, but carbon tax will be regressive. It's just not true. Right? If you play around with the electricity price, it's in, I've seen studies which suggest, certainly in the past, that it's more progressive than playing around with the income tax system. Right? The income tax system isn't very progressive. Right? If you look at VAT, right, what is progressive about that? Right? So I think one needs to have a set of context. And what it really comes down to is your total tax burden is about fairness as well as efficiency. You want to combine both. And if we look at our tax structures in the UK, and we look at the inequalities that result, that is a big question, which ought to be dealt with by policies towards addressing poverty and inequality. But I would not throw out an efficient approach to carbon and the recognition about our overconsumption of carbon on the altar of oh God, I can't think out how to do social security and poverty and inequality relief more generally. I just don't buy it. But politically, I see it does. And the prime minister is very clear that bills aren't going to go up. Well, how do bills not go up if your consumption depends so much on carbon? The only possible reason that could be true is if the alternatives were free, or at least at the same cost as the current ones. And that is, in my view, I'd love it to be true. Because it also we could lower taxes because we get rid of all these subsidies, right? But it's not. Thank you so much, Dieter. So I'm going to go to questions from the audience, and they're they're flowing in thick and fast. So I'm going to try and take as many as I can. But the first one is from uh, Galton uh, Kalgatji, who has asked: In 2019, fossil fuels provided 6.21 ex exajoules in UK in the UK. Even to replace 60% of this would require 120 gigawatts of new continuous CO2 free energy. 40 nuclear, uh, new nuclear plants of the same size as Hinkley Point, plus everything else that needs to be done. Is this even possible by 2050 for the UK alone? Well, um, uh, if you really want to do something, it is possible. You know, in 1939, if you said, could you win the Battle of Britain in two years' time? If you have 98% tax and you devote the entire economy to doing it, you can do it. Right? So I don't think it's about whether it's you know, theoretically possible. The much more practical questions are, um, is it politically possible? And is the present approach to policy likely to deliver it? Okay. Now, I don't know whether you, I, I, I can't replicate your numbers, but um, I do think if you want to see scary numbers, David Mackay's great book, uh, on sustainable energy without the hot air is still the great book that goes through the numbers. You just look at the sheer scale of the wind farms, the solar panels, the land that would have to be used, et cetera, to get you on this path to realize this is a non-trivial exercise. I mean, even the Climate Change Committee in their desire to see things like biomass, um, I'm not at all sure how all this works in climate change terms, I'm highly skeptical, but you know, it's nine to 11% of the land is needed to be moved across um, just on the agricultural side for these purposes. So my take is, it's absolutely right to do the arithmetic. If you do the arithmetic, it'll be utterly clear to you that we're not on the path to achieve those objectives. Um, and um, um, uh, we won't, we therefore will not achieve them unless it turns out that there's a combination of incredible cost reductions and uh, massive technical changes, both of which are possible. But, you know, we've got to get 78% within 14 years, right? Um, you know, on current rates, it takes at least 14 years to build a nuclear power station. So you kind of see the scope. So I, 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 I'm... I flow with the sympathy of the question, but I refuse to give up and say it's not achievable. Thank you very much, uh, Dieter. So we're going to um, stick with uh, with more general questions before we dive into some of the specifics that are coming through in the Q&A. So we've had a question from Louis Stansfield, um, who works for an energy company. Um, he says, uh, he doesn't say which one, um, do you have any suggestions over how to help communicate the idea that net zero is not going to be cheap? Because 
at his company any suggestion of potentially needing to raise prices in response to uh, rising costs of energy is simply seen as lining the company's own profits um, and compounding some of the uh, some of the cost issues for consumers rather than uh, rather than a necessary evil in order to deliver uh, our climate change goals well thank god i don't have to market things to to people i think i'd be terrible at it um but um you know because come back to my my core points the costs are what the costs are the outcomes are what the outcomes are and pretending anything to the contrary doesn't change the facts the facts are what are those costs and um how good are the outcomes that flow from them so for example let me give me an example okay I mean, any of you have had the experience of trying to have a smart meter fixed. And my energy supply company finally um, this year offered me a SMETS 2 rather than a SMETS 1 <laughs> thing. I mean, we put the things in supply, not in distribution. It was a fundamental mistake. 12 billion and counting and still not a functioning smart system in which we can do the demand side. OK, consequences, the demand side savings are later and smaller than they otherwise would have been. Consequences, the overall envelope of carbon consequences is bigger than it otherwise would have been. Right. So, you know, the costs of that aren't going to go away and customers are going to pay for that. So if you say, well, if they've got to pay more money for smart meters because we can't put up custom bills, something else has to go down. Well, you tell me what. So the extraordinary thing in supply is that nobody seems to be making any money and that bankruptcy seem to be following fairly quickly through. Um, and, you know, the government's desire, and it goes back to uh, the campaign by Ed Miliband and others um, and the uh, 215 election, is to have a price cap. Well, fine, you can have a price cap if what you mean, we want to cap unreasonable returns, right? But you can't have a price cap that says we want to cap the costs and only allow you to pass through some of the costs if the costs are legitimately entered into. So um, um, I, 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 I come back to my point. You can ex ante pre pretend that the truth is X, but if the true is Y, X post, it will be out and you will find out. Um, and it's, it's not as serious as the Battle of Britain, but you know, if we didn't make the investment fast enough to build the Spitfires, we would have lost. That would have been a fact on the ground. In this world, if we don't do the right things as effectively and as fast as we can, we will lose. We will lose in terms of ultimately our contribution to parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. And um, the difference is that in 1939, um, elimination of the country was within two years in sight, whereas it's in the next generation that's going to experience the three, four, five degrees, which will happen if we go on probably at this rate. Thank you, Dieter. Um, so I'd now like to um, move into some of the specific questions that we're um, uh, that we're getting through. So we've had two questions at least about um, the possibility of border carbon adjustments um, and uh, and tackling this um, at at the border through through taxes. So um, Alistair Evans has asked, what prospect do you see of COP leading to some kind of Border adjustment mechanism potentially targeted within just the EU. And Ted Christie Miller in my team has said uh, in your book and in your speech just now, you spoke about frustration with the fixation on territorial emissions over consumption emissions. Um, BCAs would be a good solution to this, but they do rely on other state act actors. Um, are there other universal policy, uh, unilateral policy levers that the government can pull? to reduce con consumption emissions. I wonder if you could take both those two questions together, Dita, and um, talk a little bit about both the prospects for BCAs, um, but also alternatives if we cannot convince other countries to play ball. Okay, so um, uh, on the carbon border adjustment, I mean, when, I mean, I didn't invent the idea, but when uh, I was writing about it with Cameron Hepburn and others back in about 2012, uh, this was a novel idea and people thought you were nuts. OK, um, now it's common discussion. So the EU has a carbon border adjustment proposition, which it's put at pretty much at the core of its 230 um, package of measures. That's a transformation. I was advising the Energy Commissioner in the, uh, in the Commission uh, back in 2011, and uh, you couldn't possibly imagine when we were constructing the roadmap that this would have been included. So it's on the table. It's on the table in discussions in the US and it's on the table in discussions in the UK. That's a great step forward. 
Okay, and um, I would love uh, COP to spend a bit more time, uh, COP26, on this generalizing carbon pricing, etc., and a lot less time on headline numbers, which may be close to meaningless. Um, in you know. 30,000 people rocking up to all have a triumph at the last minute because people have decided to come up with a series of national commitments that don't add up to two degrees. We've been there at, um, at uh, Copenhagen, we've been there at Durban, we've been there at Paris. It isn't going to produce the outcome top down because China, India, Africa and Brazil and countries like that are never going to be paid the amount of money to do it. The great attraction of the carbon border adjustment to me is not just that it treats domestic production on the same basis as foreign production, but it provides a route to getting a coalition of the willing unilateralists to proliferate uh, carbon pricing throughout the world. Let me give an example. Imagine a ship from China arriving at the docks in, say, Southampton with a stack of steel on board. The customs official, when they're not dealing with the latest Brexit uh, arrangements and trying to find a vet to look at each chicken that's going through, etc., a joke, but they are pretty stretched, says, right, um, where's your carbon certificate? And the ship, uh, the captain of the ship says, I don't have one. So the custom official says, here's the tax you have to pay. Happens at loads of borders all over the world with tariffs and all sorts of stuff. But if the Chinese ship uh, captain is clever, they'll say, is there any way I could get out of it? You know, paying money from a Chinese firm to the British government. The answer is, yeah, of course. Give us an exemption certificate. Show that you paid an equivalent carbon tax back in China, and then you don't have to pay one coming into the UK. Right? It is a no-brainer that any major export party faced with a credible carbon border adjustment would introduce their own carbon tax in order to pay their own governments rather than pay the British government, in my example. And what we do in that, it's a paper back in 2012, I think, I can't remember exactly, is show how in a political economy world, that bottom-up way of gradually putting together a coalition of the willing with carbon border adjustments so that they're also not contributing anymore to climate change, creates a bigger and bigger coalition, the coalition of parties and actually has a chance of getting global progress. So core to my net zero book and core to what I've always argued is, I'm very happy for people to have a good chat in, in Glasgow. Hopefully they won't spread the virus. And 30,000 people can you know, spend a lot of money in the shops and have loads of demonstrations. The media can have a field day. And, and that educates people that climate change matters. I'd rather the UN focused on processes like carbon border adjustments and things of that ilk. Um, but I want, I can't wait for that. I want a bottom up way in which this unilateralism for a global problem creates a bigger and bigger coalition of the willing. That's why I'm so keen on the carbon border tax. And that is quite a separate question, but many of the arguments, oh, it's all too damn complicated, are really beside the point. And they're by people who really don't want these things to happen. Why is it more complicated to price carbon at the border than it is from the steelworks in the UK? Not at all obvious. Thank you, Dieter. Okay, we've got, we, I think we've got about six minutes left. So, and I, I am going to finish right on three o'clock. So I know that um, people have places to go, including you, Dieter. So um, two questions to finish, and they, they get into some really specific questions that I know the government is grappling with. Um, at the moment. So firstly, uh, Amy Gray has asked, has asked, you mentioned the failure of the Green Homes Grant, um, as you say, it lasted eight weeks. Um, how do you think we can best incentivize or encourage homeowners or owner occupiers to uh, improve the efficiency of their own homes? So that's question one. And then the second question, and I'm very sorry to everyone who hasn't been able to uh, have their question answered. I've been selective in the ones that I've asked given time, but um, it's from Amy Norman, another Amy, um, who said, um, if the core point here is reducing carbon consumption, what can government and regulators do to tackle rising concerns around greenwashing, um, that being companies providing misleading information to consumers on the environmental benefit of those, com uh, those products? Is this not uh, placing greater informational burdens and remedies on consumers? Uh, uh, realistic solution. So effectively, how do you tackle greenwashing and how do you convince homeowners to do something about this themselves? Uh, 
Okay. So um, let me start with what I'll call Amy One, so I can remember the surname, uh, and the, the Green Homes issue. Okay. So one of the great delusions for the last 25 or 30 years is that energy efficiency is free. And this has been trotted out, and I'm right back to when I wrote my book on carbon crunch. The argument was that uh, it's net present value positive already. And that's equivalent to the idea there are 50 quid notes lying all over the pavement. And the problem about energy efficiency is people are too stupid to pick them up. And then it goes into a literature, oh, there must be some barriers to doing this, that they can borrow money to buy a car, to um, run a credit card deficit, but they can't borrow money to do energy efficiency. I've always thought that's nonsense. I think energy efficiency is socially desirable, but privately, I think there are very big costs associated with it. And the idea that Chris Hune had that we'll do street by street um, uh, stuff is for the birds. If you really think with an aging housing stock, what's involved in really doing this stuff, getting the builders in, taking a day off from work, being at home, redecorating, uh, all this stuff, um, then you realize that this is um, not particularly economically attractive to householders without some intervention to make it driven forward. And I would say further, in a lot of old housing stock, some of the energy efficiency measures are basically about sealing up the box. And I think that there is growing evidence that this has some relationship to the rise in um, uh, uh, lung problems, et cetera, for people as internal house pollution is kept in the pollution. And we've noticed that in the coronavirus that, you know, old houses that are sealed up like boxes um, uh, may be more unhealthy than houses like mine, which have got loads of drafts and there's a lot of air circulating around in them. So if you want to do this, recognize the private costs don't always add up. And so therefore you have to intervene to help people to do this. And that's back to the point, it isn't all just good news. It's about subsidizing some of this stuff and actually intervening to help people to do it. And the Green Deal before it, when I, I remember sitting with uh, Chris Hune and the then prime minister in Downing Street, and Chris Hewn telling us, telling people that, you know, this was, you know, cost effective, it was going to create 250,000 jobs, we're going to do it street by street. Of course we weren't. But I found myself in that meeting in a minority of one who thought that it wasn't going to work. And this time around, I say it's worth eight weeks. So let's do it and do it properly. And just think, we can't even make new houses carbon net zero. If you look at the quality of what's actually being built and the idea that a new house can't be energy efficient, you realize that something fundamental is different from the rhetoric and the reality here. On the greenwashing, I have enormous sympathy with what I call Amy too, if you don't mind me putting it to you in that way. Um, there is so much rubbish trotted out about carbon neutrality and about green products and sustainable products. And if you want an example of it, the debate in the EU about the new taxonomy for sustainable technologies with the Swedes and the Norwegians and the Scandinavians wanting to make sure that biomass gets there, you know, burning trees, that really is a key sustainable technology. You've got France and Poland wanting to build nuclear power stations. You've got a set of states wanting to have gas in the picture. You know, each of these technologies has a lobby group behind them because many of the, 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 the subsidies are technology specific. It's like what's happened in farming, the NFU, et cetera, in the renewable space and the other technologies. This is a lobby rich area where uh, pulling the wool over consumers' eyes is unfortunately far too common. Answer, proper deep inspection. And the area that I'm most concerned about at the moment is the carbon offset area. I'm not against carbon offsets at all, but all sorts of things uh, in the land use area, tree planting and so on, don't start with a scientific baseline, don't have proper monitoring and don't have proper accreditation. And um, you end up, the consumers think they're doing the right thing, like many of them did in the past with recycling and so on, and find actually it's going into landfill or whatever. They're going to find an analogous effect here. They think they're doing the right things. The overall population think that they're no longer causing climate change by going to net zero, where I started this discussion. We have to get away from the lobbyists. Unfortunately, many of the advocates of net zero and advocates of addressing climate change 
do not have clean hands either. So the, the idea, let's talk down the cost, don't tell the public the truth. Let's present the costs of this technology because it's green in inverted commas, as much cheaper than it actually is. Um, it's a wash with lobbyists, it's a wash with misinformation, it's a wash with greenwashing. And uh, it's time that, um, uh, you know, the, the laser beam, the torch was really sh shone upon it. Because otherwise, if you lose the public, and if the public feel they're being taken for a ride, we will lose the whole thing. And that would be a tragedy. Peter, that's the perfect place to end, um, because, uh, as you say, we, we really must uh, ensure that we retain public support. There is currently about two thirds, 70 percent support for delivering net zero in most polls. Um, uh, that's across every demographic, every voter group. Uh, and uh, we, we do know that net zero is rising up um, the list of salient issues um, for members of the public. Especially I have to say one more thing there. Yeah. Those opinion polls ask people if they care about net zero. They don't ask you, are you prepared to pay higher petrol prices? Yeah. Right? Note Mr. Biden, the one thing he's not doing is raising fuel duty in the United States. Right? So if you ask people, how much are you willing to pay in order to reduce carbon emissions? I think that there's a complacency about how many people are actually on board. And part of the reason that is because they told it won't cost them very much. I think that's completely right. And some people um, have done that polling. I remember some polling in that regard when we were in Downing Street. Um, people were very willing to pay for the NHS and not very willing at all to pay for uh, climate change. Um, so no, you're completely right. And this this uh, speech today has been a fantastic uh, well, a tour de force, uh, a dose of realism into a, um, a debate that is uh, gathering steam rightly, but needs to be approached with with honesty, with integrity, and with uh, with realistic, practical ideas rather than pie in the sky thinking. So, um, uh, I really, really appreciate you spending the time uh, with us today, Dieter. Um, you've given us a huge amount to think about, and I'm not going to try and summarise your remarks because that would a be um, well below my uh, level of expertise, but also uh, wouldn't do justice to everything you've said, and we've run out of time anyway. But um, suffice for me to say, and to finish this by just saying thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to everyone who uh, tuned in. Uh, I would heartily recommend uh, Dieter's book, uh, which is sitting on a shelf behind him, as well as, well as his other work on natural capital and others. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of you in the very near future at a future Onward event. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dieter. Thank you.